some of them, and uh, so you'll be able to go back and uh, watch them and share them with others. And uh, we're also grateful to Eden Council for supporting this course as they've done for the last 12 years. And uh, we're also grateful to uh, today to Kevor for coming. And we're also grateful to um, uh, Sipan and Zorik for filming these. And also grateful to Carol uh, for helping out. And probably other people like Antony, who also who, who helped us with the administration, getting the room ready, and so forth. So, uh, as I said, today is the last uh, session, and it's probably the most uh, one of the most uh, pressing and uh, uh, difficult uh, subjects, which is about the, the situation in Arabah. And um, hopefully, we'll uh, uh, we'll have another course, similar course, over six Sundays next year, uh, probably during its usual time or during the usual period of February and March uh, because uh, that's when this uh, course usually normally takes place but due to COVID we had to um, uh, delay it. So without any further uh, ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Kevor who will introduce himself and also uh, talk to them. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you all for coming. This is the first lecture I'm giving since, uh, since the lockdown last year, so uh, actually quite a nice occasion, unfortunately on, uh, on a very difficult subject, um, the very insecure situation that we, we, we now see uh, in and around Armenia. So I'm Kevor Koskanyan, I'm an honorary research fellow at the University of Birmingham. Uh, my specialism is international security and we'll talk a lot about international security today. Uh, and I specialize more specifically in, uh, in the former Soviet space. That's my regional area of expertise. I've written a book on, on security in the South Caucasus based on my PhD. I've taught at, at the University of Westminster and the LSE before the University of Birmingham. Uh, and I'm currently working on, uh, on another project on um, the crisis of liberalism, Trump, populism, and all that. That's my next project. But we'll be talking about Armenia today. And the... The structure of the lecture will have two, uh, two aspects, two distinct sections. So first we'll be thinking through what it means to be secure. What does security mean? Because it's, it's a very complicated concept once you get to think about it. Um, so I'll expand on that. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at specifically three aspects of security that are quite relevant to thinking about international security and also Armenia's international security. Namely, the fact that security is interactive, that it is multi-sectoral, that it happens in different sectors of reality, different aspects of reality, and that it, is, that it happens at different levels. So it happens at the domestic level, it happens at the regional level, and it happens at the global level. So we'll think that through, how that works. And then we'll talk about Armenia. So what happened? Why did things go wrong? Why did Armenia lose the war? the Second Karabakh War. Second, we look at the situation now. Uh, what is the vantage point as looking at things today between Armenia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, Armenia, Turkey, and so forth. And then I'll expand on what is to be done, and more specifically on the questions facing Armenian society today that Armenian society will have to respond to. Um, ultimately, it's, it, it's, it's I believe that it's Armenian society in Armenia and in Artsakh that will have to deal with these, with, with these questions that, are most immediately, that will most immediately impact on them and their, uh, and their future. So let me, without further ado, let's start with the question, what is security? When I say security, what does, what does that tell you? you know, how do you define security? Safety. Safety. Anyone else want to venture? A definition? You might say absence of threat. You know. In fact, security is what is known in, in social science uh, as a, is a, is an essentially contested concept. There are as many, 
definitions of security as there are authors. Uh, and I have, you know, I, the, this is one page from a book by Barry Buzan, which is a major figure in international security studies. Uh, and you know, he, on these two pages, you, you find 13 different definitions from different authors of what security is about. Now, there's a very classical de definition on there uh, by a, a man called Arnold Wolfers, which says that security, in any objective sense, measures the absence of threats to acquired values, and in a subjective sense, the absence of fear that such values will be attacked. I want you to keep that definition in mind. It's an old definition from 1952. And that indicates two things. So security has two aspects. On the one hand, it's something objective. It's something that you can measure. You can look at a situation and say, OK, now we have security. For instance, you can look at two states that are ranged against each other, and you can see that their power is in balance. You know, they can't really attack each other because you know, they see that the other would be able to, to respond. And you, you might say, OK, this is a secure situation because you're, they're in balance. On the other hand, you, security also has a subjective uh, aspect. So that's when you look at actors, they can be states, they can be people, and you ask yourself, do they feel secure? Do they define their, situ their own situation as secure? And you find both of these, if you look at these 13 definitions, some will be more objective, some will be more subjective. Um, and that, that also partly explains why you have so many different definitions of security. The other thing about security is that, is that it has various aspects and various things that you have to look at when you think it through at an international level. So as I said, security is interactive. It's multi-sectoral, so it, it happens in various uh, areas of human activity, so the economy, politics, and so forth, and it happens at various levels. Let's go through these one by one. I, um, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to stop me and, uh, and ask. We have to go through this so we have a very clear scientific, so to speak, understanding of what security is before we can analyze Armenia's security. Okay, first the idea that security is interactive, and that's something any actor always have to, has to keep in mind. That is that if you take measures that are designed to increase your security, you might have a reaction to the outside world. You don't, you don't define your security or secure yourself in a vacuum. You're always surrounded by other actors who might or might not react. And in, amongst poly political scientists, that, that is often called the security dilemma. Okay? The security dilemma is a situation that states sometimes find, them, find themselves in. So a state might say, OK, um, I have a neighbor, and I don't know what they neighbor, that neighbor's intention is. Uh, is, it, is. Is that neighbor hostile? Is it friendly? I don't know. And there is no government to go to, because states are all equal, right? There is no world government to go to to complain. So what does the state do? OK, decides to arm itself. I'm just going to you know, arm myself just to make sure that, you know, that I'm able to defend myself. What happens? The other state also arms itself. And you get a, a situation where both states start arming themselves. And, you get, you know, and you know, state A might think, OK, is, is confronted with a dilemma because, of course, it can say, oh, I don't arm myself and I trust the other state. But then you always have the fear of being attacked by the other state and finding yourself unarmed. Or it can say, oh, I arm myself. But then, of course, it has to keep in mind that the other state might, arm, uh, might also arm itself, and then you end up in, in, in an insecure situation. That's called the security dilemma. And I'll explain how that relates to Armenia in a second. So the other issue is that security happens over various areas of human activity. So when we say security and we talk about national security, usually what first comes to mind is the military sector. So we think about the army, or we think about the police force, you know, the, the, um, the armed uh, sectors of the state. But when you think security, you have to link that beyond purely the military sector. You have to think about security in the political realm. That's political stability, uh, civic rights, democracy, and all that. You have to think about economy. 
You can't be secure militarily if you don't, if you don't have a strong economy. Uh, something called societal security. You have to have your values secure. Uh, your identity has to be secure as well. And, of course, environmental security. And very often, these various sectors actually contradict each other. So, you know, for you might, for instance, say, you know, I live in a very dangerous region. I'm going to put all my efforts at, in military security. But if you do that, and you end up neglecting your political security and your economic security, you might end up not being able to build up your uh, military. You might end up with emigration. You might end up with corruption. You might end up with authoritarianism. So you see how that works. You have to be very careful about balancing these various sectors of security. And then the third is that security happens over multiple levels. So when you think about security in international politics, you have to think in levels. So you have to look at security at the domestic level. So the societies within a state, under a state, things like law and order, political stability, rights and freedoms. So that's security at the domestic level. Then you can go up one, one notch to the regional level, to the state and its neighbors and its immediate neighbors. That's the regional level. So you have to think about that as well. And then at the, at the highest level, you have to think about security at the global level. So that's relations with great powers who are able to be active everywhere in the world, but also the general security situation uh, in, in, uh, in global international relations. Okay? Mm -hmm. So interactive, multi-sectoral, and multi-level. And this actually explains why, you know, actually crafting sound policy is extremely difficult. And it's especially difficult for small states like Armenia. If you're a large state and you make mistakes balancing all of these things out, usually smaller states suffer. Uh, you don't. You get away with it. And God knows uh, you know, great powers like the United States have made mistakes in the past. They've paid for it in terms of budget deficits and all that, but not in terms of existential uh, issues. But if, our, if Armenia makes a mistake balancing all of this out, that's a much more serious issue. That's an existential issue for, your, for a small state like Armenia. And I believe that's what's, what's happened. You know, that's the fundamental problem is that Armenia had, an, was, had balanced these in quite the wrong way over the past 20 years, 20, 30 years. Um, so there was, things were out of kilter, and I'll go through them by, one by one. So you look at the domestic level, for instance, um, I'll talk about that. So I'll go in the next two slides through the various levels and discuss them one by one, how I think that you know, things were out of balance in Armenian policy. So let's look at the domestic level, and specifically from the, level of, you know, from, from the perspective of these various sectors that had to be, that had to be balanced out. So, in Armenia, the one thing that was the most important was the societal sector. It was about identity, about values, about protecting the Armenian nation, uh, uh, and um, specifically Artsakh, defining the Armenian nation as including Artsakh and, uh, define, uh, and basically doing all of that. Now, the problem is, of course, that this was inherited from Soviet times, from before Armenia was a, was a state, uh, and it continued during, during the, the post-independence era. And that led, of course, to a very high emphasis on the military. So Armenia was one of the highest spenders in terms of percentage of GDP on military, uh, on military equipment in the world. So it was in the top three. I think it was 8% of GDP went to military, uh, to military expenditure. And that had its effect on Armenian society as a whole. So political... Uh, the political, political security for most of the 20 years was defined in terms of a very questionable type of stability. It wasn't based so much on the rule of law and democracy, but more on um, fluctuating forms of semi-authoritarianism. So, you know, forged elections and all that. And that's not really a way of, of securing your domestic political stability. Democracy was put, uh, was put on a black, back burner. Uh, in the economy, whereas a normal, normally balanced uh, polity would emphasize growth, 
and have an eye on its demographic, uh, um, demographic evolution, uh, what you saw in Armenia, and we have to say it, was corruption. Uh, and one of the things that, corrupt, that, uh, that a country like Armenia without natural resources cannot, one of the things that it cannot afford is corruption. We often talk about corruption in Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan is oil. It can afford its corruption. Armenia can't. And that was one very quite neglected issue of within the economic sector over the past 20 years. And of course, emigration. That has to do with all, all, all the rest and the demographic collapse um, of, uh, of Armenia. So these sectors were out of, uh, out of kilter. And that had very real effects in terms of Armenia's general security. One of the things you need in order to secure yourself as a state is a healthy economy. And what, we, what you see, especially from about 2005 onwards, is a complete divergence between the Armenian uh, and uh, uh, Azerbaijani economies. So uh, this yellow line here is GDP, of, uh, the GDP of Azerbaijan. This is Armenia in blue here. So from about 2005, there's a real divergence uh, between the two. So there was a greater and greater imbalance. So I'm explaining why, ultimately, the conflict occurred. Um, the other thing that was out of kilter, and that explains also what happened in October, uh, in October nine, uh, last year, October, November last year, was the extreme imbalance in military spending, a direct effect of the economic disparities between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So this is a military spending in the South Caucasus from 1992 to 2014, and you see this very clear here. Again, from about 20, 2006 onwards, you, you see this enormous disparity. Uh, and this, you know, at the time people were saying, well, it, you know, Azerbaijan has this huge uh, defense budget, but it also has enormous corruption, which was true. You know, Azerbaijan is much more corrupt than Armenia. And, um, of course, Armenia had topog topography in its, in its favor. Or that's what, what Armenians always counted on. But at some point, the disparity becomes so big that uh, it is no longer, ten it is no longer tenable. The, the balance is off kilter. Um, and just to illustrate, I mean, this is a graph of Armenian and Azerbaijani military strength uh, in 2020, September 2020, at the outset of the war. There is already an advantage here between Armenia and uh, for Azerbaijan, you can see that very clearly. The red bars are much larger and so forth. But, this is, but even this hides a very crucial fact, namely that Azerbaijan's military equipment was much more, much, much more up to date. Um, everyone has heard of the drones, the Bayraktar drones and drone warfare. Uh, and it's one, of the, it's one of the major problems that Ar Armenia faced. Not only was Azerbaijan's budget much higher, it was also much more up to date with its tactics and its, and its strategies. Um, so that's one, one problem that Armenia was facing. The other problem that explains what happened, in your, these are different ways of explaining, by the way, the, the war, why it occurred. So one is the idea that there was this huge imbalance between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The other one is that um, in the South Caucasus, you have a wide variety of um, regime types of um, Types of government. You can see this in this list here. Okay. There, there is a strand in political science that says that, that that's called the uh, democratic peace thesis. Democratic, democratic peace, have you heard of that? The idea that two democracies never go to war with each other. Yeah? It's, it's, fairly, you know, it's fairly well known. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a major strand of, of, of political science thinking. Um, and if you look at the South Caucasus, you can see why that doesn't work uh, over there. You, know, you, you, you have, at most, semi-democratic states. So the most democratic states in the, in state in the South Caucasus is Georgia. I mean, these are figures from last year. So Georgia is the most democratic state. Then you have Armenia, actually not very far behind, 55%, but it's still a semi-democracy, -democ according to Freedom House, which is an organization that compiles data on, you know, and on civic freedoms, the quality of elections, and so, and comes up with this score. So it's out of 100, the higher the better. Uh, so Georgia 60, Armenia 55, 
Nagorno-Karabakh, they also rate uh, unrecognized uh, states, so Nagorno-Karabakh 35, but then all the rest, they're all full-on authoritarian states. So you have Turkey with 32, Russia with 20, and Azerbaijan with 10, which is a really bad score. Now, just to give you an idea, the UK has a score of 93, so that's as, you know, almost as democratic as you can get. North Korea has a score of three. So just, you know, these are the two extremes. The problem with this is that people who believe in the democratic peace thesis, so political scientists who look at things from a liberal perspective, because that's a liberal way of thinking, they will look at this and say, well, yeah, when you have a democracy ranged against an authoritarian state, that's problematic. Democracies tr trust each other, but a democracy versus authoritarian state, the way you had it in the, um, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, that's much more problematic um, for, for, a number of, for a number of reasons. And added to that, of course, that is that you know, Ar Armenia is considered a semi-democracy. There's a whole argument about the fact that you have to be a full democracy for democratic peace. To but you get the idea. So there's another way of looking at things and saying, oh, this is why Things, uh, why things went out of hand in, uh, uh, in September last year. And then there's a final way of looking at things, and that, is, uh, that actually emerges from an approach to international relations called constructivism. And constructivism deals with identities, with how people and peoples define themselves and define their own territory. And constructivists will look at the South Caucasus and they will look at how Armenians and Azerbaijanis define themselves. How do they define their own countries? And you can see here very clearly, so we all know that, you know, Armenia, so you have uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, so you have uh, Jav uh, Javakh, and then you have Western Armenia. Um, so many Armenians define, when you say Armenia, will define Armenia much more broadly than the internationally recognized borders of the Republic of Armenia. But you have a similar thing in Azerbaijan. You know, Azerbaijan always you know, says that you know, it has this idea of territorial integrity at the top, but as, as, as you probably all know, uh, Ilham Aliyev has referred to, the, uh, to Armenia itself, to Republic of Armenia itself, historical Azerbaijani lands, basing himself on the presence of, uh, of um, Muslim Khanates in uh, places like Erevan and so forth. But you know, if you if you want to think take things further, Azerbaijani nationalism or ethno nationalism has this you know, you have, has this extreme territorial claim. I mean, if you want to take it really into into its greatest extreme, you even have pieces of northern Iraq somehow included in, in this map. So you have you know you have this this piece. You have also south, what what um, Azerbaijani nationalists refer to as southern Azerbaijan, so Iranian Azerbaijan. And then you have something Iranian national, uh, sorry, Azerbaijani nationalists refer to as Western Azerbaijan, which is pretty much the Republic of Armenia. And then, of course, the biggest problem of all, Artsakh, and the various claims that, Azerb that Azerbaijanis have on Nagorno-Karabakh based on the complicated histories. And actually, these kinds of conflicts about identity and values are the most difficult to solve because they, they touch on the very way people define themselves. Uh, and you know, that's why the, uh, uh, the Armenian-Azerbaijani uh, conflict has often been referred to as an enduring rivalry uh, by people like Lawrence Brewers. It's, an, it's a rivalry that, you know, it's one of those rivalries that take decades to resolve if they're revolved at all. Think about Cyprus. Think about India, Pakistan, all that. So it falls within that category. So this is the regional level. Now let's look at the global level. At the global level, if, and we're, we're talking about the involvement of great powers, how were great powers involved in the past? They were involved mainly through the, mainly through the Minsk group. And the co-chairs of the Minsk Group, so that's France, Russia, and the United States. The problem with the Minsk Group was that it was never one of the core, it was never defined as a core interest of these great powers. It was always a sideshow. You know, they had some level of investment, but it was never the kind of investment that you see in, for instance, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. 
Not the kind of uh, not the kind of investment where they would make um, serious compromises or put serious pressure on the sides to come to, to, to come to an agreement. So that was one thing: uh, relative lack of investment, and of course the Russian role in the South Caucasus. Russia is you can't avoid Russia in the South Caucasus. It's still there. There are plenty of people who were saying during the war. Um, in September, October, you know, looking at Russia very late to react, saying, oh, Russia has given up on the South Caucasus, they deploy, and then they, you know, they suddenly, on the 9th of November, we hear Putin has, uh, has negotiated this, this ceasefire and Russian troops are coming into, into Karabakh. But Russia, Russia has always been there. You know. And the basic setup for Russia in the South Caucasus is as follows. So it has an alliance with Armenia. It has a formal alliance with Armenia through something called the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Remember that? We'll talk about that in a second. And it also has a fr friendship treaty dating from 1997 where there is a mutual assistance clause. So it, it does have an a formal alliance with Armenia. Apart from that, it has the 102nd military base in Gyumri, uh, where there are a few thousand, uh, a few thousand um, uh, military personnel stationed. And of course, not to forget, Russia also uh, guards the border between Armenia, uh, the external, external borders of Armenia. So the borders between Armenia and Turkey and, the, and uh, with Iran, uh, they're staffed by border guards uh, of the FSB. So uh, Armenia also received preferential, uh, arm, uh, uh, preferential arms, arms sales. So all the arms that it bought over the past uh, two, not two decades, but several, uh, several uh, over the past years were at knockdown prices, at preferential prices. Um, and of course, Armenia is also a member of the Eurasian Economic, uh, Eurasian, uh, sorry, Eurasian Economic Union, if you remember that, in 2013, 2014, when Armenia was supposed to sign a, an association agreement with the EU, and Sarkisian was called to Moscow and told, actually, you're going to sign the Eurasian Economic Union, and that's, that's exactly what he did. Now, that does not mean that this alliance is aimed at a specific country. And this alliance is not aimed at Turkey. It's not aimed at Azerbaijan. Why? Well, because Russia describes its relationship with Azerbaijan, not as an alliance, but as a strategic partnership. So it has this, you know, this idea, this, um, it does make an effort to maintain relations with, with Azerbaijan. And it goes vice versa as well. Azerbaijan has been very careful not to upset Russia too much, although they, they did, I think, push the envelope a bit by inviting, uh, inviting mercenaries and, Tur uh, and Turkish military personnel during, during the war. Um, they, may, they took a calculated risk there. Um, and let's not forget, Russia also sells arms to Azerbaijan at market prices, but Azerbaijan can afford those market prices. So, the other thing that you have to keep, keep in mind, that, and this is something that I actually argued in, in the book that I, that, I, that I wrote in 2013, is that for, uh, for Russia, the Karabakh conflict has a pivotal value because it, it, it forms part of an effort to divide and rule the Caucasus. It is because of the Karabakh uh, conflict that Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan can't cooperate trilaterally. It's a fundamental break within the region. And I don't believe that it is interested in resolving the Karabakh conflict once and for all, unless that solution somehow solidifies its role in the South Caucasus. We'll discuss that in a second as well. Uh, and very importantly also, all these Russian alliances between, all these alliances between Armenia and Russia do not apply to Karabakh, to Artsakh. They only apply to Armenian territory, to the, to the territory of the Republic of Armenia. And Russia has been very clear about that in the, in the past as well. So that is sort of one thing that you have to take into account. And that, by the way, Azerbaijan also took into account in September of um, 2020. The other issue that I talked about at the global level was the general state of international relations, right? How, what, what is happening globally in the world? How is the global international system evolving? And up until 2008, one of the things that changed in the run-up to 
last year's war was that the liberal international order, uh, the liberal principles that used to govern um, international politics, that that was breaking down. And in order to understand that, I want you to think about you know, the way things were in nine, from about the 1990s to about 2008. You know, if you go back and you look at how politics functions, functioned, you very much had a dominant West. Its norms were the only norm. Um, you couldn't really be fully authoritarian without taking a risk. So if you were authoritarian, you had to be very careful and keep your, keep your head down. Um, organizations like the European Union, like the Council of Europe, like NATO, had conditionalities. They made cooperation conditional on certain human rights norms, democratic norms, and that. And that all of that controlled authoritarian, uh, authoritarian beha behavior. So authoritarians, there were authoritarians, but they have to be very careful to ingratiate themselves with the West. And that changed from 2008 onwards when this system slowly but surely declined. And things like populism, Brexit, Trump, and all that. And Trump is absolutely not interested in keeping up these liberal norms, disciplining authoritarians, and so forth. So uh, there are more, there's more to that than that, but you, know, you, you, get, you get the idea. The liberal system was, was declining. And that means that authoritarians had greater autonomy. You, know, you, could be, you could be more authoritarian and get away with it too. It explains, for instance, why you see the emergence of Erdogan in Turkey, much more authoritarian than any other leader since, since, uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, things like Orban. But to, take, to, to make things worse, over the past decades, authoritarians also um, were also able to perfect the ways they manipulate those liberal institutions themselves. So they were able to do things like the Azerbaijani laundromat, channeling huge amounts of money to Western politicians. You know, just recently, there, is, there, there was a corruption uh, scandal in, in, in Germany um, with several MPs caught literally receiving funds, funds from, from Azerbaijan. Um, and then, of course, you have organizations like Gazprom, Rosneft, um, Russian state monopolies handing out directorships to various politicians or former politicians, people like Schroeder and so forth, as rewards for being pro-Russian. So authoritarian states have become much more adept at manipulating uh, the West and so forth. So that's the global level. In the run-up to 2020, and it explains to a great deal, um, and these various explanations uh, look at what happened in September 2020 from various, as from various perspectives uh, and from various levels. So what about the situation today? Now, most of you will know the ceasefire agreement signed on the 9th, uh, on the 9th of November. So just to recap, the ceasefire agreement provided for the withdrawal of Armenian forces from around those territories, not uh, those territories of the Nagorno-Karabakh region, as it existed in, in the Soviet, uh, Soviet era, not held by Armenian forces. So that's the, that's not held by Armenian forces. That's this dark green here. Now, this had remained, and then here, Agdam. Uh, this part had already been captured by the Azerbaijani forces. So this teal, you know, and this is what remains of Karabakh. Um, Russian peacekeepers were introduced, but remember, they only have a five-year term. After that, uh, essentially, Azerbaijan can expel them, if it dares. Uh, that's a really important question. Uh, it also provided for the unconditional exchange of POWs, which you all know hasn't happened. There are still 200 Armenian POWs in Baku. The opening of transportation links and the opening of the transportation links under Russian supervision. So the links between, between this part of Azerbaijan and Naichevan over... Can see. Can you point it out yourself? Oh, oh, you can't see. I thought, I thought you saw this. We can't see yourself. Okay, so, yeah, so you, the transportation links here over the province of Sionik between Azerbaijan proper and Naichevan would be uh, under Russian supervision. So you would have more Russian border guards essentially 
supervising these transportation links. Now, there's a whole issue about whether these are corridors or links, and that is actually a very important, important issue. But um, I've looked at the document. I don't see corridors. It says links, not corridors. So, yeah. And then, of course, the most important part, which has been essentially kicked in the long grass, Nagorno Karabakh status, Artsakh status at the very end. Um, and that's, the most, of course, the most difficult issue of all. So let me go through the various levels again. So what about the regional level? Um, the Karabakh war has certainly exacerbated and um, illustrated the imbalance of power between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And if the, if the Russians had, hadn't entered Karabakh, and if there wasn't an alliance with, between Armenia and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and Russia, um, things would have been much, much worse than they are now. Uh, because uh, right now, uh, the Aliyev regime is doing everything to maximize its advantages uh, in the run-up to the negotiations that, are, that will no doubt be around the corner after the elections in Armenia. So, and, and that, to some extent, explains why, why you have the situation around, along the border now. It's using what are called salami tactics to slice off little pieces of Armenia, which is then can bring to the negotiating table uh, once, once things go off. This is also, for instance, why it keeps 200 POWs in, in, Baku, as a, uh, in Baku. Again, they're a bar bargaining chip. It's very cynical. It's, you know, it's pure power politics. And it, it does so because it knows this is a window of opportunity. There's this huge disparity of power. Let's grab as much as we can. There are other reasons as well. There's also an internal reason, reason um, and that explains other issues um, like um, you know, the destruction of Armenian monuments, the albanization of Armenian monuments, things like the, the, um, uh, the Victory Park with these horrible Armenian mannequins, uh, things like um, even, even the use of the word uh, of the, word, of the word corridor, uh, the, the constant humiliation of the Armenians, is partly also based on a domestic requirement because, of course, the Aliyev regime is not elected, it does not have democratic legitimacy, and what it has to do is get the maximum out of this victory on the battlefield. You know, Aliyev wants to style himself the great victor of you know, the Second Karabakh War as a way, partly, of camouflaging his lack of democratic legitimacy. And then, of course, there's, there's the broader issue of Azerbaijani nationalism, which is built on the idea that, you know, of the, on the Albanian myth, the Armenians are, are intruders, you know, keeping that, that alive is also part of it. But all of that is, of course, com, com, um, combined with, a, with talk about transportation links and how they will benefit everyone in the... Uh, in the in the region, and how they would even be able to benefit Armenia. So in a kind of way, it, uh, the Aliyev regime is talking in two ways, depending on who it is talking to. Uh, but certainly towards Armenian uh, society, the emphasis has been on humiliation um, and really making the most out of highlighting that victory and keeping that memory alive. The question is whether that will continue after the elections or not. Um, in any case, the identity conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan, we all know that they, they're as unresolved as ever in spite, of, uh, in spite of everything. And if anything, they've been reinforced by, by Turkish involvement uh, because, of course, you know, Turkey is there. Everyone immediately thinks 1915 genocide and links what happens now with what happened in, 1915, uh, in 1915, which makes it much more difficult for Armenians to... Uh, deal with that. What about the role of the great powers? You know, Russia has, of course, now become uh, the great arbiter in the conflict. It's the only one with boots on the ground. And it's the only one that will probably have a defining influence on what happens next. Um, and to some extent, uh, what happened was the result of Armenia's, I believe, uh, this is my personal interpretation, 
over-dependence on Russia over the past 20 years. Uh, it's something that, that you really saw. And um, on the one hand, you know, if you look at Russia's role in, in the conflict, on the one hand, yes, it has saved the Armenians of complete annihilation, which was a real possibility if, if Russia hadn't been there. But, uh, you know, and there's, there are several reasons why it intervened. Uh, one, of course, was that it didn't want to see its ally humiliated, completely humiliated. Uh, that would have been a bit too much. But there are other reasons as well. Remember what I, t what I said about Russia not being interested in the Karabakh conflict being completely resolved either way. That also played a part, part, part. They intervened so that you would still have Karabakh as an active issue. Um, rather than Karabakh completely ethnically cleansed, and then, you know, I know that that sounds extremely cruel, but that's the nature of international politics. You know. that, uh, so that was one factor that might have, uh, uh, that might have influenced their thinking. Um, and of course, you know, the unique opportunity to finally insert troops, boots on the ground, within the South Caucasus and having more, more uh, broader and more permanent presence within the, within the region. I know that that somehow, you know, some people say, oh, why would it do that? It, it, it's, it's an enormous cost. But that completely, uh, uh, it completely dismisses Russia's view of the South Caucasus as its backyard and the importance that Russia gives to the South Caucasus for its own soft underbelly. Because remember, Russia's own part of the Caucasus, the so-called North Caucasian republics, that's a very, um, in, uh, how would you say, uh, unstable, uh, unstable region in itself. And what you've certainly seen is a limited commitment to its alliance with, with Armenia uh, in recent days. And there are all, all kinds of ways you can speculate on that. But for instance, you know, in light of the territorial in incursions in Armenia, the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is supposed to have a, a mutual assistance clause between its allies, has been curiously slow and silent in reacting to these incursions. Uh, uh, some people have said, yeah, of course, you know, it's not proven, but then I think, what would NATO do if you had incursions into, Russian incursions into Baltic territory or, you know, any kind of, it would give the benefit of the doubt to its, to its ally. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that the United States and France have come out with statements that are much more, much um, clearer uh, in their condemnation of, or in their, uh, in their calls for Azerbaijan to withdraw than, than Russia itself. Um, so, it's the Russia's commitment to its alliance with Armenia has been relatively subdued. You might also link that with, with the ongoing election, by the way. Um, but I won't speculate more, more, more than that. Um, the other thing that has become clear between Armenia and Azerbaijan is the extent to which the, the equipment that the Armenians are, are armed forces were given um, because of their dependence on Russia. Um, they were relying almost on, on, uh, exclusively on Russian, on Russian equipment. It was quite outdated and ineffective compared to Azerbaijan's report. So all of that, all of this are, you know, are costs that Armenia has paid for its exclusive dependence on Russia. And, ver and the most important one, I think, is the fact that Russia's lukewarm intervention in, in, in favor of Armenia, I think, can mostly be explained by the fact that um, it could take Armenia for granted. Armenia had nowhere else to go, and Russia knew that. Whereas Azerbaijan was quite adept at playing off Russia, Turkey. It has options, and you, you, in order to understand that, you have to know that Armenia has chosen the Russian path without any kind of what political scientists refer to hedging. Hedging means that you, you don't put all your eggs in the basket, you just have an exit strategy if something happens, if your ally doesn't quite respond to you. Whereas Azerbaijan had a, what, what it called a multi-vectoral strategy. So playing, engaging with different, different sides. So knowing that, I believe Russia basically said, we can take Armenia for granted. Uh, Azerbaijan is ours to lose, so we won't go too much in Armenia's favor. Anyone?
So these are all costs that come with excessive dependence. What about Turkey? Because Turkey raised quite a few eyebrows because of its, its, its direct involvement um, and very vocal support for Azerbaijan. Well, why did it do that? Well, the conventional issue, uh, logic is, of course, Azerbaijan and Turkey have a very close um, ethnic identity. No, they, 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 Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan is probably the most, the closest uh, Turkic ethnic group to the Turks themselves uh, from a lingu linguistic perspective, but there are other drivers as well. You, know, you have domestic drivers. Don't forget that uh, Erdogan's popularity has been going down in recent, in recent years. The Turkish economy is not in, in a good shape, so you know, a, a kind of a nationalist diversion might help in counteracting that. Uh, don't forget also that Azerbaijan and Turkey have extensive um, economic interests, not just Turkey and Azerbaijan, but also Azerbaijan in Turkey. Uh, Azerbaijan's elite has bought up considerable economic assets in Turkey itself. And there's also the geostrategic and geoeconomic calculation of creating a link between Armenia, uh, sorry, between Turkey and, and, and Azerbaijan. So all of that played a role. Now you hear a lot in, in Armenian uh, in um, analysis in Armenia about pan-Turkism, and you know that kind of idea of all Turks from between from the Balkans to China coming together and being united. Uh, that is actually I think it's, it's it's mistaken to see that as a core driver of Turkey. Because don't forget the um, the AKP. Erdogan's party is not a pan-Turkist party, it's, it's, an, it's a pan-Islamist party, it's an Islamist party. The MHP, on the other hand, that's the ultra-nationalists, the Grey Wolves, yes, they are, uh, yes, they are pan-Turkists, but they're the, they're the junior um, coalition partner. And you should also look at, you know, firstly, the Central Asian states are absolutely not interested in pan-Turkism. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, they're, they're, it doesn't appeal to them at all. Uh, Turkey has been very careful in the Uyghur issue, when you would say well, a real pan-Turkist would go all out in favor of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang in China. It doesn't do that. So you should see this pan-Turkism that you see, the pan-Turkic discourse that you see, is more of an instrumentalization. They use that in order to mobilize their populations in Azerbaijan in Turkey, uh, and Turkey. Um, because Azerbaijan's nationalism tends to be statist. It's about the Azerbaijani state. And every now and then they come up with these ideas of two states, one people, and all that. But that's rhetoric. Shouldn't put that too much in value on that. And then, of course, yeah, the systemic level. Remember last September, you still had Trump in power. And Trump is not interested in human rights or democracy or, uh, or other such liberal stuff. Um, and if anything, he, he likes authoritarians. So, you know, that... The decline of liberal order that I talked about was also uh, was also very 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 relevant, um, and they are still you know now you have of course Biden in power you might think that that might stop that this might reverse things that the liberal order might come back, but really you have to be very careful with that um, because. The decline of the liberal order is a secular trend. It's a long-term trend. And one presidency is not going to make, make the difference. So this is another thing that you have to take into account looking at the situation today. So liberalism is there to decline. And um, Armenia and Armenia's policymakers will have to take, into that, uh, take that into account. So yeah, uh, today, Armenia, because of the collapse of many of the assumptions that it had over the past 20 or 30 years, faces multiple, uh, multiple questions. And um, you know, it, going back to the, various, to the very complicated nature of security, so it faces questions like how to balance the various sectors of security in view of its defeat in the Second Karabakh War, how to uh, managed relations with neighbors who have now become more problematic because, of course, the, of the very clear imbalance of power, the very changed balance of power between them. And then, of course, uh, it will have to ask itself questions on what to expect from the great powers 
from Russia and also from the other, uh, other powers. And I'll go through, through these one by one. So regarding the various sectors of security, balancing them out of so military, political, economic, societal, there are various questions that have now, now uh, popped up and that are very relevant to the, um, to the election that we're seeing now. And I, 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 won't, uh, I won't express myself on the election, so I, I, I'm very strictly neutral in that. Um, so one of the questions is just how much, what are you going to do now? Are you going to, is Armenia going to emphasize the military sector even more? Is it going to turn itself in, in, into kind of a garrison state where everything is aimed at the military, where it, you know, where it tries to create a military-industrial complex of its own or, and so forth? Or does it go more into, in the direction of a liberal democracy um, with, a, with uh, emphasizing economic growth, um, democratic freedoms, and, and so forth? Um, now, very often in Armenian society nowadays, that seem, that's presented as kind of a choice. It's either or. Um, you either have military security or you have li liberal democracy. Liberal democracies are, are weak. They're not, they're not able to, um, to engage in efficient warfare. Actually, you know, it's not that straightforward. There's plenty of work in the, uh, in the political science literature that says that democracies are actually better at fighting wars than authoritarian states for a number of reasons, because of their, better, because of their improved ability to mobilize populations. They tend to mobilize them more slowly, but they're much better at keeping them engaged and so forth. Um, and don't forget, you, know, you have other countries like, countries like Switzerland that do have a strong military without turning themselves into garrison states. So, you know, of course, that's a bit far-fetched, but just to say that it's not, it's not necessarily contradictory to have an efficient military and a liberal democratic system. The other question that uh, Ar Ar Armenian society have to has to ask itself is whether it, it emphasizes geopolitics, so control of territories, um, whether, or whether it emphasizes geoeconomics, so economic growth, transportation links, and, and so forth. A third question it has to ask is how to define its citizenry. Uh, is it going to continue the idea of pan-Armenianism? So Armenians and people associated with the Republic of Armenia are the, citizen, the residents of the Republic of Armenia and Artsakh itself, and also the diaspora as a whole, or is Armenia just the representative of its citizens? Um, there is an implicit debate in Armenian society going, going on there between this pan-Armenian idea or the statism, and that, ref that of course relates to the place of Artsakh in the, Armenian, in the global Armenian community, and of course the role of the diaspora in Armenia's uh, future. When it comes to its neighbors, um, again, Armenia is faced with a number of, uh, of dilemmas. Um, and there we have to remember that security is interactive and that it takes two to tango. And the real question is whether Azerbaijan will continue in its triumphalism. Uh, of course, if it, if it does so, if it continue, continues humiliate, humiliating Armenia um, and trying to press maximum, the maximum out of its victory, then, you know, then any process aimed at normalization or reconciliation is dead in the water. Uh, if it doesn't, then you might see uh, the opening of transportation links. Actually, the opening of transportation links will probably happen, partly because Russia has invested itself in it. Uh, it's very clearly interested in opening some form of transportation links between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan that it would then be able to control. Um, so that's pretty much inevitable. The question is what happens then between Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey? And it is very important there to make a distinction, a clear distinction between normalization and reconciliation. These are not the same things. So normalization is the opening of embassies, so talking to each other directly, or opening of border posts, which is a possibility. And don't forget, normalization doesn't mean that states necessarily have a good relationship. I mean, 
India and Pakistan have embassies in their capital and you know, they're at loggerheads the whole time. Turkey and Greece are, have embassies in their capital. So open borders as well. Again, open borders doesn't mean free trade, just that there is some kind of interaction between the borders. Reconciliation is a completely different uh, topic. And as things stand now, there is no prospect of that happening in the short or even the medium term. But the most probable outcome of this is what, what uh, political scientists refer to as a cold peace, just two sides not shooting at each other. And that's a very low bar, but that's probably what, what will happen in the near future, especially since Russia is so engaged in this, wouldn't allow it to get out of hand. Then perhaps you would have an opening of transportation links, but that does not mean that you, go, you immediately move to reconciliation. Um, if only because, remember what I said before about conflicts that have to do with identity, um, with the way people define themselves. You know, that, that, these are very weighty issues, and people are very often willing to overrule you know, economic logic, oh, let's trade, let's make money, because of such um, identity issues. This is an identity issue, so, you know, uh, reconciliation, I think, no, that, that will take, if it ever happens, will take dec decades. And of course, a lot will depend on what happens on Karabakh status. And there you have to be, you know, it's very difficult to acknowledge that, but you have to acknowledge that Artsakh is now a Russian, not an Armenian protectorate. It used to be under Armenian protection up to November 2020. Now, uh, the Russians are the ones protecting, uh, pro protecting Artsakh. Uh, which is, of course, you know, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, the Russians would be able to protect Artsakh if necessary, but if they see it in their interest to come or to press Armenia in a certain, into a certain direction when it comes to Karabakh status, there's very little Armenia will be able to do to resist that. Um, if effectively, a lot is in Russia's hand. And there are all kinds of ways in which you can imagine for it, um, Imagine Russia giving up on, on, on Artsakh. Uh, if it, for instance, you know, has these transportation links and that it controls and that solidify its influence over, over the South Caucasus, then you could see them press, pressuring the uh, Karabakh Armenians into some kind of, some kind of arrangement. Um, not to forget, until that's the case, it's in their interest to keep the issue open. So, uh, yeah, and that, that's, of course, the great question for Armenia, what to expect from the great powers, from Russia specifically. Uh, and one of the great questions now is, of course, what, how, how will relations between Armenia and, and, and Russia evolve? Does, our, does, does Armenia go for greater integration with or dependence on Russia? But you know, at this point, Armenia is so dependent on Russia that that would come at the cost of Armenian sovereignty and statehood. It's a dilemma that people in Armenia will have to decide on in the, in the next election. Um, as I said, you know, Russia is unlikely to unequivocally take Armenia's side in all of this uh, unless Azerbaijan miscalculates in a major way. Remember, it's, it, it does have an interest in keeping Azerbaijan on board. It has keyskeepers there. It doesn't want to expose them to unnecessary risk. And of course, it can take Armenia for granted, at least for now. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, it's not interested in a final solution to Nagorno-Karabakh unless it solidifies its places in uh, its place in the South Caucasus, and you know these are structural realities. Any government that comes to power will be faced with this reality of of Armenia's dependence on Russia, and the choice to be made between oh, do we go for more dependence, or do we uh, and give up some of our sovereignty or statehood, or do we um, somehow balance, uh, adopt a more balanced balanced approach? So in conclusion, um, Armenian society faces very difficult dilemmas on the eve of the elections. And it's not very surprising now that, you know, that the election is very hard fought. Uh, and it has apparently become very close in recent, in, in recent weeks because these are very difficult, uh, difficult times. Uh, people are off balance and they have to make very difficult decisions on the future of their country. Um, and many of the questions that are being asked, by the way, are not right or wrong questions. 
They're value questions. They're about how, how Armenia defines itself and how Armenia defines its own, its own, its own, um, its own reality. But um, for a small state like Armenia, and, I'll, and that's the only kind of advice that I would give, it is important to maintain a clear view of the requirements of security and the limits of its power. And I'll conclude with this guy here, Niccolo Machiavelli. Um, <laughs> Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, not, not in the sense that Armenia should become this ruthless state that does anything it takes to, you know, uh, that goes into all kinds of immoral or amoral um, uh, directions in order to achieve things. No, no, Niccolo Machiavelli had, had other points to make. Uh, and one of the most important points he made was uh, involved a fox and a lion. It's one of my favorite parts of the prince. So he, t he, he says that a good prince acts as a fox when he's weak and as a lion when he's strong. So you have to be very, very aware of the power you have and define your interests uh, accordingly. Um, the other idea that Machiavelli has is the idea of virtu. And it's not virtue, it, it, it's, it's not virtue in the English sense, so, you know, being a, I don't know, being a faithful husband and all that. It's about being a good citizen of a state. And, the other, and that's one of the insights that I think is lacking among Armenians. Armenians are an old ethnic group, so they have a very long history, but they're a very young state. And Armenians have a lack of state-centric thinking. It's very difficult to do that. Armenians were stateless for such a long time. Their nationalism emerged under statelessness. And one of the things that it hasn't done is move towards a state-focused nationalism. Uh, the idea that the state is the primary, primary and its survival is the primary uh, area of concern. And that is difficult because it will also require not engaging in all kinds of moral crusades and being realistic about the possibilities of Armenia. And I'll, I'll end with a slightly controversial, perhaps, note, but for instance, commemorating the Sevres Treaty. I think that was uh, counterproductive and pointless uh, because the Sevres Treaty is not something that Armenia can achieve anytime soon and will probably not be able to achieve. And I'll make the point, doesn't have val validity under international law. And to me, it was also puzzling why Armenians would commemorate a treaty, the Sevres Treaty, that promised them much, but that was abrogated, that was overruled three years later in the Lausanne Treaty. If anything, the Sevres Treaty is, is an insult. Um, you know, it's this kind of thinking that, you, that Armenia should let go of many of the illusions that it has and should be able to, also very important, not rely on the kindness of strangers when it comes to its politics and its external politics. One of the things that really upset me about, about things during the war were the appeals to Western powers and Western media. Why aren't you speaking out? By the time you're appealing to these Western powers in statecraft, it's already too late. The war has already started, and there's very little the outside world can do or will be able to do because you know, whether or not people intervene depends on their national interest. Um, so it, it, this kind of, and it, I'm talking about polit Armenian political culture in general, thinking, n not counting on the kindness of strangers, but being aware that strangers will intervene only if it's in their national interest to do so. This awareness of your own interests and of the interests of others, I think that is something that Armenians still have to, um, still have to get a grasp on. Um, and yeah. And with that, of course, a healthy skepticism of the promises from all great powers. Um, I think you know, great powers do what they do because of their national interest, not because of uh, compassion or humanitarian. Sometimes they will act in, in a humanitarian way, but when it's not too costly, when it doesn't counteract their national interest. But yeah, a healthy skepticism towards Russia, for instance. There are too many Armenians, in my view, that idealize Russia. They say, oh, if we just align with Russia, everything will be okay. Russia, you know, our brother and so forth. It doesn't work that way. And I'll conclude here.
So, where do we go from here? <laughs> so, uh, a million questions to be answered. <laughs> thank you for all the, thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, thank you for making us think. And, uh, I'm, I'm even reluctant to ask, to, to ask you to actually ask questions in, in fear of how long this can take. But, uh, <laughs> I myself have about 10 questions, but uh, no, but seriously, um, the only thing I will say is that uh, this kind of uh, talk and this kind of um, issues should be a regular event mm -hmm. where these kind of things should have been taking place, debated 30, you know, for the last 30 years, so that we could have actually had some maybe influence to what's actually happened now. And that's a very sad and uh, Background of our, our Armenian society in the diaspora, that mm. the debates and the discussions really haven't really genuinely been taking place right. in, in, a, in a critical form. Uh, there's no Armenian forums where people, communities can get together and actually discuss things. They're more interested about commemorating the past, you know, be it religious, be it, you know, April 24th. You know, those are all valid. I'm not dismissing them. I'm just saying the contemporary reality of Armenia, Armenians, political, social, economic, whatever, has just been completely, doesn't exist, unfortunately, it hasn't existed. And there's, a, there's a great thirst for it now, and it must come soon, otherwise we're not going to move forward. So. Can I something, say something on that? Actually, I have a very clear view of the relationship between diaspora and Armenia. I think there's a, there's, there should be a separation between being culturally Armenian and being politically Armenian. Um, so, there, there's the Armenians as a cultural entity, and that includes all Armenians you know, throughout the world. So, you have the homeland, Artsakh, Javakh, and, all, and the diaspora. That's the cultural Armenia. Uh, that's cultural Armenia. But then you have political Armenia, and that's the citizens in Armenia uh, and in Artsakh. The people who, you know, who pay their taxes, and it will be mo most directly affected by political decisions they make own their own polities. I think that that's very important. Diaspora can play a role, but it has to be a supporting role. It can't really decide for Armenia and Artsakh what should, what should happen. That's my view. And I've, been very, I've been very strong about that because, for instance, one of the things that I haven't done is apply for uh, Armenian citizenship because I am not an Armenian citizen. If I want to apply, you go back, you live there, you apply. But to put mm -hmm. that in practice, mm -hmm. what should be taking place or should be taking place has been a much more critical uh, perspective position by our ministers from abroad, uh, in the sense that you know there's this blind worship, not necessarily of Armenia, the state, mm. but rather the successive governments. Mm. You know, uh, so it, uh, I can give you so many examples. It's just a completely blind worship of one corrupt government after another, mm. one corrupt official after another who came to this country or visited. Uh, and, and the list goes on. We should be much more critical of how the Armenian government behaves because there is actually not just a political fallout mm. in terms of what's happening now with Warabak and the state, but also the immigration. And as a center which actually mm. deals with Armenian refugees, I can tell you that for the last 20 years, refugees do come, mm. not, nice, not in great numbers, but they come to. UK, they go to America, they go to France, they are so we we feel what's going on, and not just in terms of refugees, but the, the dependency of our of Armenians and the failure of the state, because we get calls for charitable donations by mm. individuals, uh, people want to study scholarship, which may, you know, which, which they, they, they should be studying, there's not two ways about it, but I'm just saying, the continual uh, demand for financial support by Armenia, by Armenians, uh, I mean, the, the perspective, the, 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 the perception that people have um, of, you know, on both sides, both in Armenia and abroad, are completely mm. uh, out of sync. I mean, there's no other way I, I can put that. There's a lot to repair. There's a lot to uh, discuss and, 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 and clarify. It's... Sorry. <laughs> and all your questions, all your comments, especially Kevin's patience in dealing with it. As Hasbik said, this shouldn't be the end. This should be the start. And these two should take place regularly because only by through regular debate
And can we become even clearer, you know, improve our communications, have a clear understanding of the realities that we face, both in Armenia and abroad? And um, so, yeah, let's continue to meet as and when we can. And thank you once again. Please, uh, even though uh, Kevo is going to go back to Birmingham, please, uh, I'm sure he'll be here for to, to speak to you one to one uh, as you so wish. Thank you again. Thank you. No.